to the cloud. Perfect. So welcome, welcome. Um, quick bit about uh, well, this, this the, the title to this is is fortified and festive. So fortified. Um, uh, it, it's slightly misleading in that not all the wines are fortified. Uh, they do have a higher alcoholic content, but fortified wines in general, um, when we say the fortified wine category, that's because they have had at some stage of the process um, a, a grape spirit predominantly, but it's normally a, a spirit, 80%, 90% um, alcoholic volume put into the, the base wine. Uh, and there's a variety of different reasons for doing that. Um, some of it is to sort of predominantly it's to either add a little bit of body to the wine. Um, it's uh, sometimes they use it uh, to stop the fermentation. Normally yeasts sort of for, for still operate till about sort of um, 14, 15 percent. And then they sort of die off when the alcohol gets too big. Um, and there's a lot of tradition and there's a lot of stories and we'll see some of those as we sort of go through um, our, our tasting this evening um, that over the years um, there's actually you know the you know from, from very long time ago we're sort of talking sort of 13th 14th century as, as they were beginning to um, make uh, and transport these wines they would actually add alcohol uh, in the wines to stabilize them for the long journeys um, across uh, by by sail, by sailboat to all sorts of different locations because they found that the normal wines wouldn't last the journey of three, four months on the decks of a boat in the sun, in the sea salt. And so they needed something to stabilize. So for without further ado, if you can crack open your uh, the Barbietto, the rainwater reserve. OK, so um, we are actually in uh, the land of Madeira here. Oh, he's, I was trying to pour half of that, but that's failed stratospherically. So I'm, we're going to have to drink all that. So um, for those of you who are uh, drinking alone, um, probably not drink every single one of them. Don't pour every one into a glass. I tried to just pour this one half and, and failed, but that's OK. It'll be my first one. But there we are. So we are um, in Madeira. Um, so Madeira, I was desperately scrabbling around for a map um, and failed dismally um, today. But we're, we're, we're off the, the Atlantic coast of, uh, of uh, Portugal and Spain, really quite quite far from, from the mainland. Um, and Madeira, it, you know, it's it, the, the islands, are, they're, they're, there's quite a few of them, but, um, you know, they've been in the Portuguese um, sort of, uh, I guess, hands since about the 1420s. And, um, you know, they, they've really built up their own unique style of, of, of making wines. Um, and that really comes from, you know, if, you, if, if, if we, I'll try and bring up a little map of, of Madeira in a second. But um, if you see where it is, it, you know, it's a long sailing journey wherever you go. So taking wines off the island were quite sort of problematic to get the fresh wines over. And what they were finding was that when they were really sailing them, you know, it was a sort of stopping point as they were trying to go across the Atlantic um, and get to sort of all sorts of um, uh, uh, far off flung paces. And they were finding that long journeys at sea during the summer um, where these these barrels were getting, you know, uh, in the in in the hold of the, of the, sh the ships um, were actually slowly getting baked in, in by the heat. So it was very hot and sort of sticky in, in the, the bowels of these these big boats. Uh, and so they would actually essentially slowly bake um, and virtually oxidize over time. So um, what you get uh, there is, is you get this sort of slightly well, we call it slightly Madeirized because the Madeiras are in fact essentially fully oxidated. Um, and so that means that they really can't, not age any further, but they can't sort of go any further than, than, than at this level. So whereas wines in general, we try and avoid oxidation and we put a cork on it and, and we try and keep it, you know, uh, uh, under, uh, under wraps as much as possible because as it oxidates, um, you know, it loses its freshness, it loses its flavor. However, the, the wines of Madeira, they actually have a huge amount of acidity already. Um, and uh, through this, this, this process of, of slow um, 
baking essentially uh that they're, they're, they're sort of oxidized but they also have this wonderful madeirized slightly burnt tang nose um so great varieties that you see predominantly in 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 madeira so so do tuck in i'm going to have a quick slurp myself mm. Mm. so hopefully most of you have, have chilled that but it's so lovely it's got such a lovely complex bouquet it always reminds me of that sort of Christmas pudding, you get sort of citrus peel, you get um, almonds, you get nuts, some nutty notes in there. Some people get hazelnuts. And, you know, you really get such a sort of wonderful, it's just an explosion. And so that's why the, these things, you know, the, these wines are just so underrated because they provide pound for pound so much pleasurable drinking. So what you've got here, um, it's actually, um, so the grape varieties, the, there's quite a few grape varieties that make up Madeiras. Um, uh, the, the, there's four sort of noble grapes, which you have sort of Cercial, Boal, um, and he's looking desperately at his notes, um, where these are the, those are the sort of the main two. Uh, and you'll often see maybe very, if you're lucky, you have these very old bottles of sort of 1850 Boal Madeira or, or 1902 um, and they're normally made specifically from that grape and specifically from that uh, vintage and because they've been oxidized they are literally are indestructible so that's why you see these very old bottles that are not readily available but you know you can see and taste 1860 1880 without great difficulty compared to any other wines and the thing is is once you've got this open it 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 can't oxidize so it is probably the only wine that you can put at the back of the christmas booze cupboard and it'll still remain fresh we make that mistake with port and with sherry those don't last until the next year madeira not a problem you can even leave the cork off admittedly it probably won't do it any great good but you can leave the cork on uh, and it's fantastic but these are these will last in the fridge for a little bit so a little bit more in, in regards to uh, the grape variety in this one, we've got the Tinta Negra or the Tinta Mol, um, which is kind of uh, the catch-all grape variety in Madeira. It's grown um, probably in the most. Um, and it, very simple, sort of, it, it's harvested um, like any other. Um, it's then uh, fortified, uh, sorry, it's, it, it's then goes through just normal process of uh, winemaking. Uh, and then when it's reaching a level of, uh, uh, of dryness, that's when they will fortify it. Um, and then they will place them, traditionally what they would do is they place it in the barrels and they place them in very hot cellars, which are normally under the beating sun. Nowadays, um, it's this, the process of estufagem, which is, is basically baking, um, has been sort of modernized somewhat. Um, and so there's, either barrels that are in you know properly heated rooms through steam uh, steam heated pipes or in the case of this rainwater um reserver they're actually in big vats where they're being they've got pipes of, of heated steam that are running through the actual large stainless steel barrels to slowly bake these wines over, over several months um the reason we're the funny enough the the the, the reason it's called the the, the rainwater um reserver is that the story goes, well, there's two stories. Well, one we're pretty sure is the, the correct one, but there's the more romantic one. The, the first one is that predominantly the, the barrels that were traveling along uh, on the deck of ships, because they couldn't go into, into the substructure, those would get rained on quite heavily in the Atlantic storms. And the barrels would soak up so much water that they dilute the flavor of, of, of the Madeira. The other story uh, is, is probably Americanized, and it's probably why rainwater Madeira was so popular in the US uh, a, a while back, was that these barrels of Madeira arrived from Portugal, sat on the docks um, in, in you know, one, one US town, for, for in, I think in Virginia, and got rained on for the whole summer and no one picked them up. And again, a lot of water got into the actual barrels 
the wine the the wine merchant was particularly unhappy but then tasted it went oh actually that that's pretty much lighter and easier drinking style for for the the americans uh, and hence rainwater madeira became a, a, quite a popular drink um once it's gone through its estufagem they will begin to sort of bring it back up with a little bit of sweetness um and and, and then this will age i think it, it ages about seven to eight years before it sort of comes uh, comes about um so uh, it's called the five-year-old, but they, they basically there'll be a mixture of, of, of different barrels. Um, so the minimum age will be five, but they'll probably have seven and eight and, and ten-year-olds. Um, and, you know, for, for me, it, it's uh, I, I'm a big, big fan of Madeira. I don't know, has, has everyone, is this anybody's first time of drinking Madeira? There we go. Pleasant, unenjoyable. Do we have likers? It's quite drinkable. Uh, well, it's quite drinkable. But uh, I think I think probably one of the things, the important ones, is, is that it's slightly chilled. I think that's really when it comes into its own. The chilling brings out the the, the acidity of, of of the um of the wine, and also lets some of those sort of really caramel, burnt, tingy notes really come come to the to the fore um and yeah so um you know this is essentially considered more of a sort of entry level uh, of the madeiras and like i was saying we can then go to the more um serious uh single varietals um the boil the marmzy uh, and and then and there are can be aged from you get special reserve which is 10 years you get extra reserve which is 15 years and then you start going into vintage, which is essentially has to be the noble grapes from that year. And normally seeing an aging of around 20 years minimum. Um, but like I say, you can you can have these um, up to 50, 60. I was lucky enough. My great uncle gave me a bottle of 1868, um, which I had a couple of years ago. Uh, and it's um, it's pretty amazing to, to think, you know, you're drinking that and it's a, a beautiful wine straight out the cork you don't need to decant it don't need to let it open up it's it's absolutely brilliant um question from anna what does this go best with um i think you know um you uh, you can either have it uh, as an aperitif um which is lovely um i very i, I sort of have this when i'm cooking I, uh, I i really enjoy it i think it's just got so much flavors and stuff i think it's really something that can can blast over quite a lot of dishes you just have to be prepared to try it so you know um obviously a cheese board would would be absolutely brilliant um uh, you know something like a game terrine would still hold its own you, you've got that sort of acidity which is going to cut through the fat you could essentially do it with a dessert i think the sweetness the problem with with desserts is, is you've got a sweetness that you need to combat um and so this may lose in that I wouldn't go to sort of chocolate with this at all. Um, but do you know what? One of the, the most interesting things that I've, I, I enjoy the occasional cigar and I've found that the Madeiras is probably one of the few things that can actually combat the, the flavor of a cigar in your mouth. It actually just manages to beat most of the things that you, um, uh, that the cigars normally obliterate in terms of your, of your palate. This comes across. Um, Hillary saying, if it's oxidized, what's the effect of aging? Um, it's, it's a good question. So uh, essentially, uh, the the oxidation is part of the uh, process, but you're going to lose as it ages. You're going to lose a certain amount of of water as well. So you're going to concentrate those fruit flavors, um, and your um, over time the acidity might change as well. Um, so yes, you know you got to remember that it's. It only really goes in, into bottle pretty much when it's close to um, to, to really be put out to market. So um, in the barrels, it is oxidized, but it's still having a lot of interaction with air. Um, and so there, there's still a lot of sort of chemical reactions that are going on um, over over time. Mm. Trina Collins saying chili nuts. I mean, shortbread. Yeah, we could do shortbread. Yeah, I think I think that might that might work. I think probably something like this would would pretty much 
ride roughshod over pretty much uh, mo most of the flavor profiles. Um, and, 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 you know, this is a lovely, quite delicate, expressive Madeira, um, but you go for some of the more aged, you know, um, the, the, the sort of special reserves and stuff. And the, the power and the unction, not the unctuousness, but the, the actual real burnt tang flavor is quite impressive. Um, so hopefully you've, you've enjoyed that one. I'm going to have to keep the pace quite a bit because there's quite a lot of information to get over to you guys each time. So there's some questions on, on, on the Madeira far away. Otherwise, put them in the chat if you remember them. Luckily, I brought some other glasses. So now I am going to try and show you a map if I can find my way. No, that's not going to help you at all. Um, so now we're, we're still um, in, in Spanish Portuguese uh, territory. Uh, we're actually going to our, our friends in Jerez down in the southern part of Spain. Um, and if I can make the magic of Tinterweb work, I can share with you, not that screen. I don't want, to, I don't want France. Um, let's see, no, it's not, no, it's not, 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 not gonna let me, no, no, definitely not gonna let me. Oh, it's so annoying. Um, yeah, there we go, okay, right, here we go. Uh, let's see, can I share this with you? Yes, ta-da. Okay, so we're, we, um, in, in, uh, in Spain, we've got the uh, El Maestro, the Sierra Amontillado. So that's our second wine. Okay. All righty. So let's try for half a tube. Not quite fail again. I think I'll just say I'll pretend to fail and see how I go. So, um, Sherry, um, I think, again, one of these drinks that uh, ha has sort of suffered slightly, um, uh, and it actually, it, it was a victim of its own popularity, um, and that was part of its downfall, in that um, it, it was, it, uh, uh, you know, produced, and, and its location, essentially, um, so we're right down here in, in Jerez, um, I'll just sort of zoom in. So we're right down here near Sevilla, near, in Malaga. So um, you can see Cadiz, uh, if, for, the, for those who are all, at all nautical um, minded, it's the perfect harbour really to pull into. You're coming out of the Mediterranean, you're about to hit the Atlantic and you pull in into a harbour, into a sheltered harbour and you load up on the local food and booze. Um, and what happens in Jerez is you've got the fantastic sherry. So they're made from the 100% uh, Palomino uh, grape, um, which is a, a relatively thin and quite racy uh, wine. I mean, if you just had a, a, a Palomino uh, white wine, um, it, it'd be pretty um, unenjoyable, should we say. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not something that's massively palatable. You do see some, some Palomino wines around, but um, the, the base wine that's going in, in, into this is really not what you want to be doing uh, as, as a sort of a, a nice drink. So anyway, you've, you've got the, this, the Palomino wine made uh, to, to a certain uh, level. Um, and then what happens uh, at, at this stage, it's probably around sort of 13, 14%. Um, it's then fortified um, to, 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 to bring it up um, and, and to sort of stop, stop the, the, the yeast growing. And then at this stage, what they really want it to do is um, develop the all important uh, floor. So the floor is a F-L-O-R, is actually a, um, is actually a mold uh, and it's it, what it does it's quite important so what it does is that it, it creates a, a little layer on the top of the wine which does does one of several things um it the, the most important is that acts as a sort of protective barrier sort of an antioxidant uh antioxidation layer um so um it, it you know the wine underneath can't it, it can't be oxidized um and what then happens is that yeast or that floor, um, it feeds on the oxygen, it feeds on the alcohol in the wine, 
uh, and it feeds on the glycerin. So it feeds on the sugar that's also in, in the base wine. And what it does is it's, it, it actually reduces the acidity of, of, of the wine. Um, but it also increases what are known as the acetal, I can't even ever say it, acetaldehydes, um, which uh, give it some of that, that flavor that we're, we're getting. Uh, and it's, it's the classic flavor uh, of the Fino sherries. Um, and uh, what we have here is an Amontillado, which is essentially an aged Fino. Okay, and so the, the Fino um, is, is one of the styles that we see. We, we also see um, uh, sort of different, we have the ones, the, the Finos from down further towards the coast in San Lugar, the Barbera, uh, and they, they have a slightly different style. Um, what we have here is essentially it's this aged Fino. Um, what we see is that over time, they'll let that floor slowly die off um, and it will basically allow the, the, the fino to ferment to a complete dryness. So that's the, when we say Amontillado, there's the two classic style, well, sorry, there's two styles. There's the classic style, uh, which is fermented to dryness, which is what this is. Okay. Uh, and then probably the Amontillado that the English are more well known to are the ones that have been commercially sweetened. Okay. Uh, and those are the ones that probably are in the blue bottle that uh, at the end of the, the aisle at Christmas time, which we don't mention here because we're not allowed to. Um, it's illegal because um, it's a it's a it's a bit of a travesty because it's made for, you know, it's just made as a style that should be very consumable. And unfortunately, it gives sherry a, a bit of a, a bad name that it should be sort of sweet and sickly and only a man should be drinking it uh, for, with a tipple. And that's not what it's about. Um, and, and I think that was, you know, one of the big problems we've had with sherry. The second one is that it became so popular, as we were saying, is that there was a lot of people making copies of it. There was a lot of people making cheap sherry. And so it, it, it sort of at the end of the 70s, early 80s, it really fell out of favor because it was, you know, in big sort of two liter bottles and, and it was really sort of falling um, in quality and it really wasn't going anywhere. So there is a bit of resurgence and there's a lot of work going on by the sherry body. Um, uh, and um, they've actually done a lot of work as a, as a to, to get together the sherry body to say, look, um, first of all, we're not going to let any bulk shipments of sherry leave. OK. Um, oh, Anna, that's just not fair. Come on. That's, that's harsh words. I'm going to cut you off. I'm going to drop your video feed. You, you can't you can't call sherry crap. Damn it. Seriously, who let you guys in? I have the power to throw you out, you know. I notice that Anna's run off, or is it you? <laughs> it's you posting, I see. Anna, Anna's actually gone to the loo and she would never post something so rude, I know. So, um, but there is that problem. I, and I think it is a bit of a Marmite sort of wine. Um, and, and you, you know, you, you've, you've got a, well, maybe, maybe you're just, your palate's just not tuned enough. No, I should never say that, because that's not fair. And as quickly type in, go, that wasn't me. It wasn't me. That was my husband. No. Um, so again, look, um, it's not for everybody. People do that, that is that sort of saline acetyl high flavor that people don't enjoy. But for me, yes, I, I think it has um, that acetyl high sort of nose. Some people say paint thinner and it's sort of ripper, but. Um, mm. I, you know, you get on the palate, there's just such a complexity. There's that nuttiness, there's that dryness. It's crying out for some salted almonds. It's crying out for a little bit of manchego. All of that, that it'll work absolutely well with. And I know it's not something that people will just pick off the shelf. Um, and, and like I say, the, the Spanish have been working immensely hard to try and protect and make sure that the product that leaves Jerez is the top quality. So before they used to bulk ship it out in containers um, and send it all around the world. Now it has to be bottled in Jerez before it can leave. And so that gives them a lot more control. And I know, you know, a lot of people, you know, they will take, you know, their sherry and they'll drink, you know, obviously the, the Tio Pepe's of the world. And, and there's nothing wrong with Tio Pepe, but it's made for the mass market. Whereas this, you know, it's, it's, it's aged, we're looking at a 12 year old uh, wine here. So they've really put some effort into it. And 
the, the complexity that goes into it, I'll try and explain it quickly. I'll just see if I've got my picture of the aging system that they use which is known as the uh, Solero, so, Solero, Solero system. So it's not, not to do with ice creams, um, sadly. So don't get excited, uh, Dominic. It's, it's got nothing to do with that. Um, you essentially, I'm just bringing it up for you so you guys can see it. Where are you guys gone? Um, no, oh, I've lost you there. There we go. So it, it, it's quite an impressive system called the, the, the Solero system. And what it is essentially is that because a young uh, style of, of sherry will be pretty unpalatable, it won't be that exciting, um, to keep it essentially uh, a, a sort of blended but consistently able to sort of be able to draw off of it, they have what's known as the uh, Solera system. And essentially right at the top here, your young wines go in. Okay, so it's wine with the youngest average age and they're, and they're on different levels. So they're called criaderas. Um, and they'll, they'll normally be three or four stacks high in all these barrels. And essentially, they're all connected and they draw into each other. OK, and so you've got the youngest, the youngest wines at the top, the oldest wines at the bottom. OK, and so everything is constantly sort of feeding each other. And every once in a while, there'll be the running of the scales, which is when they draw them off. And they'll draw off a certain percentage at each Criadera level. And you get then this sort of complexity and you then are able to take a little bit off of each one, but then the, the wine constantly is feeding the next level down. So you get this amazing ability to, um, to con constantly be feeding essentially the, the, the sherry butts. Um, and, and it's quite a clever system. And I don't think there's anybody else that's done it, but it gives this uh, amazingly ubiquitous style. And you know, you've got between 12 to 20 years worth of, of, of different sherry stocks there. So it's, Really quite interesting, quite complex. So it, it doesn't deserve to be called crap. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, it deserves a lot more respect than that. <laughs> but what do we think? Mix it with a seven-year-old Havana club, an Aperol. My good Lord. Um, yeah, Toffee Negroni. Okay, that, that's, um, I'll, I'll, I'll add that to the, uh, the Christmas cocktail list. Um, actually, Tom said he was, he was doing cocktails in, in a in a couple of weeks so that's quite interesting so but i know i, I think a lot of people sort of have a it's a bit of a marmite so I, I has anybody not had sherry before and tasted this and thought that is exactly what i was looking for yeah no, no one's flying in there <laughs> quite all right quite all right so those are our two first uh wines I don't know if anybody's got any other questions about sherry. I've been keeping it relatively brief because you could probably have a whole hour on what makes sherry and a whole hour on what makes Madeira. So I'm having to keep it relatively uh, brief. But I, I think there's a, there's a huge amount of history in both of those um, wines. They really are wines that have developed massively due to, due, due to their location and due to feeding uh, the habits, predominantly of the English, it has to be said. Um, to, to sort of keep them well stocked in alcohol um, uh, over time. So, uh, and that's why we see a lot of English uh, names to, to some of the big merchants that used to be down in, in Sherry. Now it's more Spanish, but definitely um, uh, at Madeira, they, they slowly reconverted themselves over from, from to the Portuguese. But we're still uh, on, on our next wine, which is the, the Newport LBV. Um, so I won't, I won't, I don't think there's any need to show you, but, um, so if you like to go into your glass, where there, um, and Portugal and especially Porto, uh, it really was heavily influenced by the English and you still see the names of some of the most famous ports, Taylor's, um, you know, Symington's, uh, Fonseca, you know, they're, they're, Fonseca's probably not the English, the English name I probably should have chosen, but Ta Taylor's, you know, is, is one of the classics and it's a very English name because essentially it was English traders that really brought brought them over. So Sherry's always associated with, uh, with Christmas, but I think it might be nice chilled at the end of a summer's evening. Absolutely, Dom. Um, it, it's, um, I, I, you know, I think you'll find a lot of people who are um, the wine trade 
uh, we, we all have a slight penchant for sherry, uh, and you'll normally find a, a bottle of half, um, uh, half finished uh, Amontillado in, in, in most sort of wine tradesmen's and women's fridge, essentially, because it's just a, such a different style. Um, and, and, you know, it really, I mean, I'm still tasting that Amontillado. I'm still getting those notes. I'm still getting that beautiful almonds. But anyway, we'll move on. So we are in Porto, which is actually behind me. So this is the, the Jura region. Um, and uh, history is, 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 you know, it goes back to a very long time. But again, your, your, the, 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 the reason for, for the port trade to have really uh, exploded was um, England was getting most of its wines from France. They had a, a, a little falling out for a hundred year war. Uh, and so we needed to, to partner up with some other people that could provide us booze ASAP. I think at that stage we we weren't getting too well on with the Spanish either, and it was quite a long sail all the way down to, to Sherry. So they found that they could pull into to to the port of Porto, again off the Atlantic coast, and um, the supply there was coming from the Juro region. It would come down the river that you've got here, the the, the Juro, um, and then it would be loaded onto ships to, to sail out. And they were finding that the robust reds of Juro weren't quite making it all the way to um, England in a good state. And so they said, well, look, why don't we stabilize it with some alcohol? And they pour in the 80% grape spirit. And then over the long journey back to the UK, um, they would, they, you know, that would have some time together and it would sort of meld into uh, what we know as port. So quite a few different structures of port, but the concept is, is that you, you make your wine uh, and as it's fermenting, uh, they, tread the grapes, that was the old school way. And they still do that very uh, ripe for the top level wines, but now they use different types of machinery. In big open concrete vats was the old way. And the concept was, is that you really wanted to get maximum extraction of the grapes in, in the wine as quickly as possible um, to basically make it as tannic and, and as structured as possible. And then, what would happen is, is you then pour in the grape spirit. And so as it's fermenting, it's still got a lot of sugar. It's still got a lot of tannins and you pour in that, that grape spirit and that stops the fermentation dead. And so you're left with a lot of extra residual sugar. Um, although you're at a higher alcohol level, the, you know, the yeast hasn't been able to eat all the sugar that it would have done because you've immediately jumped from sort of 10% alcohol to 22%. And that's sort of killed everything off. And so you're left with, uh, a, a high alcoholic, well, high, 20%, but with loads of sugar, it's then aged. And so we've got different. So the, the ones that the English are, are renowned for enjoying is the vintage uh, ports. And those are made uh, on the declared year. So not every year is declared. And those are obviously, um, you know, the, the best of the best years. Uh, and, they're, and, and they're put into bottle and they require about, you know, minimum 20 years we think so people start drinking them every uh, after five years but there's people that don't really want to wait uh for, for that sort of length of time and so what you've got here is the lbv from from dirk newport's uh stable um it, the late bottled vintage and it was something that's it's relatively new in terms of uh, as as juro goes and it's been around about 30 years and the concept is is that people weren't quite ready to wait that long for for their ports and so what they do is they age them a little bit uh, in oak and then they put them straight into the bottle. And it's really made to be drunk uh, at a relatively young uh, age. Uh, and so what's wonderful about the, the, the wines, especially for well, the, the, the wines of, uh, of Juro, but at, at, at more importantly, their ports, is that you're getting great varieties that you don't see anywhere else. They, you know, they're the Tariga Nacional, uh, Tintacao, uh, Tariga Franca, there's just all great varieties. You literally, they, they can't trace most of them back. Um, and they really are quite specific to the region of, of, of the Juro. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, on the tasting sheet, it says, and others, because there's a huge mix uh, uh, of different grape varieties that you see. Um, and it's just a completely different flavor profile. So obviously on the nose, you get that lovely brambly fruit sort of literally sort of 
baked crumble, uh, sort of, you know, those, those baked sort of blackberries. Mm. You can feel that tannin still there very much, but you get that wonderful hit of sweetness. Um, there's a great amount of acidity there, really sort of holds uh, and lifts the wine, but you still, it's very, very young still, um, the late bottle vintage. Um, you know, th this can probably age in bottle. Uh, it, it's not it's not like a, the, the uh, vintage port, which is really made to age phenomenally long in bottle. Um, this 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 wine is very much more for consumption. But, you know, you, you can comfortably hold it five to ten years if you really wanted to. And it would have come to absolutely no harm whatsoever. Um, and, and, you know, and it's become one of the most popular stars because there's right at the entry level, you've got ruby ports, which, you know, pretty much only good for you know, unless they're coming from a great producer, sort of a, a cheaper aperitif or, or more sort of cooking styles of, of, of port. Uh, and then you're, you start climbing your way through, um, you know, if you're going it, it, it straight into some sort of aiming for the vintage port, you get the late, late bottle vintage would be your sort of next best bet. You can have the other styles, um, which are essentially ports that are still aged in the, in the oak. Um, uh, and those are absolutely delicious, but they sort of they they slightly sort of change colour uh, and, and become a slightly different um, style of port. Um, but for those who you know who want that vintage port sort of style, um, but a entry level price it, it, to get into vintage port is quite expensive, and then you've got to wait thirty years. So um, you know this late bottle vintage is is a great forward thinking idea by the Portuguese especially the Juro, and they are a really tight-knit group um, within the Juro Valley, and, and they all sort of speak with one voice to try and create some of these things. And so some of you may have remembered they're sort of trying to, um, let's say, sex up the, uh, the the port trade by coming out with pink port, which luckily died a death. Thank you. Thank goodness. I think you still see it, but um, I, I was actually working at the time for the port, um, the port trade body, the IVDP, I was doing some of their PR here in the UK and they said, we're going to come out with pink port. And I was like, oh God, no. that's just not a good idea. Um, but anyway, they, they soldiered on. Um, and yeah, luckily it sort of it fell, fell flat on its face. Um, and then thoughts on white port. Um, I think uh, white port, you get, you got to remember that when the Juro was uh, up until the 1960s, they didn't actually have electricity up there. Um, and they were relatively cut off. They made amazing wines and you can see the terraces behind me. If it, uh, Some of you may have gone there on a trip. If you haven't, I'd recommend it for a long weekend. Um, Dom, Dom and Steph, I think your, your dad actually said he was going to offer a, a romantic weekend. I think we all heard it here. To, to, to Porto. So yeah, it's there. There's Christmas. Yeah, sure. Christmas. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, but it, it really is a, for, for a quick short and a hop um, in, in our pretend that we don't have this problem of, of a certain V word that we won't mention. Um, it's a real hop, skip and a jump over there. And it's a lovely weekend. Uh, you can go up into the Juro for the day uh, and the wines are amazing. The scenery is amazing. But when I went there, having read loads about it, it really is, it's an alien landscape. I mean, this is looking quite green, but I, I sort of went and, and you know, they, they, how they grow grapes there is, is incredible and they've been doing it for so long. Um, but they, they basically had no control. So they had all these different grape varieties everywhere and it was the field blend and they just harvested in and, and, and they sort of make it. And then they realized that they sort of were like, well, these white, white grapes, well, we'll just add them in where we can. And then they were like, actually, it's pretty rubbish. So they would make, you know, probably much the white port would be for home. Uh, and it, each of the Kinters would have their couple of barrels, their couple of pipes of, of, of white port that they would only drink at home. It's now, you know, I think it has its place um, as a bit of a, um, uh, an oddity, but it, it drinks very well. But, you know, they struggle to find a home for it. Uh, and they have white port tonics and they just have straight white port. But it's not, it, I think it has its, you know, its place on the shelf. But it doesn't have that for me anyway, the complexity and the depth that, that you can get in, in the reds because the white ports are made from just two great varieties. So um, it's, it's not, you know, amazingly different. Taylor's try to reinvigorate it with the, the Taylor's dry chip wood port, whatever it was called, the dry chip. Um, 
and um, you know it, it has its place but I think if I was going to be grabbing something like that which is very much a aperitif it'd be more on a sherry front that I would go to um, but obviously not in your household Lundians so so that's I think that's quite popular I, I know there's been some ums and ahs uh, on, on on my the other selections but um this is very much that sort of it's got that lovely warm and character it's very sort of reminiscent for for many of us of, of colder darker nights um and especially you know with a bit of um I, I, you know, i'm looking out complete darkness now but um you know it, it has that sort of very warming uh, feel to it so i understand why we, we all have a passion for for some ports Portugal do everything so well. You're absolutely right, Trina. From frying some some lovely anchovies on the side of a of a beach, through through to making some really interesting wines. And actually, Portugal as a wine region is absolutely amazing. You forget slightly side off off of what we're doing now, but they've been making wines for for you know for millennia, and they've got some great options and some great opportunities. And they're now beginning to sort of hone their skills and you're getting some really good value wines coming out of there from completely different grape varieties that we don't see. And they've either missed the boat with getting excited about Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon or completely eschewed it just because they didn't want it. And yeah, I, I think there's some brilliant wines and, and um, you know, most of us have probably still remember from holidays to, to Portugal and to various golf resorts, tasting some pretty much unpalatable wines. But in fact, if you can dig those past that, um, there, there really is some excellent wine. So don't be afraid to pull some Portuguese wines, especially off the shelf here in the UK. I, I think there's, there's a lot of good work doing that. Anyway, um, the Newport goes well with salted almonds. Yeah, absolutely. Salted almonds pretty much goes with anything. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Right. Um, I realise that we're, we're, we're slowly uh, running out of time. Um, so now, uh, the, the, <laughs> the next wine is relatively, uh, off the beaten track in terms of fortified because there's no fortification involved whatsoever, but I blame Tom for this, which is brilliant because he's not here, um, is that, um, there is a certain amount of, um, concentration of flavor. So we say, so what we've got here is the Amarone from the region of Valpolicella. Okay, up in the Veneto region. So um, as I attempt once again to uh, bring bring you uh, a, a wonderful map, um, so you can bear with me. Uh, so, but we we are obviously in Italy, um, and we're looking at a wine that's um, mainly made from Corvina and Rondinella. Those are the two grapes. So um, again, Italy being very helpful with its naming the wines of Valpolicella made from two different grape varieties they got nothing worth but what's really brilliant is there is a grape variety called Valpolicella so that's to really confuse everyone um but um let me just try and see if I can bring you uh the delights of our Italian map and let's see if we can do that um and see if I can share you, Are you, um, well, you, get, you, you get two for some reason I don't, I'm not, not entirely sure how that's happened but there we are so anyway we <laughs> we're up in Venice uh, uh, in Veneto okay so quite importantly we're, we're relatively cool climate here um, and, and uh, we're about sort of three four hundred meters so you're not getting these very heavy baked sort of styles however they quite cleverly came up with this idea that um, what we should do to concentrate the flavours is to essentially take these grapes uh, and um, uh, take them off the vine um, at end of the summer and then put them onto straw mats. And the idea behind there is because they couldn't quite or, or they thought, well, we, we can't quite get the ripeness that we wanted. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll actually um, let them let them rest on these straw mats, um, and I think they called it um, appassimento or, or um, rasinate, which is essentially raisining of, of the grapes. And so essentially, they're just removing a bit more water from from the grape variety, and that's concentrating the flavour. 
and then Anna said, is this a normal Amarone at 16 and a half percent? The answer is yes. Uh, Amarone is a big bruiser and that's why we kind of shifted it into the fortified, predominantly because you've got a huge amount of sugar in your wine. So what they press is a very sweet wine, but they've got local yeasts o o over, the, uh, over the decades that um, can actually still produce alcohol all the way up to sort of 16, 17% before they die off. Um, and um, uh, which is quite rare in the sense that most of them start dying off at about 12 to sort of 13 percent. And then what they'll do um, is, is essentially then that they'll press them towards really the end of the summer. And you'll see them. They're just miles and miles of these drying racks, straw rats, racks. And they'll just let those those slowly um, dry, dry out. And then they'll obviously blend, uh, you know, press them and, and, and make them into wine. And essentially the drying process, it kind of, it polymerizes the, the tannins. And, and, and what that does is it really sort of, it kind of brings a little bit more balance to, to, to the wine uh, and creates this sort of smoothness, which is belying of its 16 and a half um, flavor. And yes, it is quite alcoholic. There's no denying it, but, and, and you know, it, it's not, it's not something you pull out for a lunchtime tipple at sort of Wednesday with your pasta because you're never going to see tea time. Um, it, it, it's definitely, definitely not that. So, you know, at Amarone, you do need about four people to, to share a bottle unless you're Dom. But, you know, that's a, it's another problem. Um, so you see, I, I did, I did, I did warn the laces. No. So but the lovely thing is, is you're getting this concentrated fruit flavor. I mean, the nose is just amazing and that's why i was saying look just try and hopefully some of you might have been able to pour pour it into your glass a little bit earlier is that it's just got this kind of slightly raisin nose um and then trina says it's not but i don't, I don't i'm not sure what we're talking about trina <laughs> mm. and funny enough you know you can actually get um a, a, another level of of, of the uh, Amarone, which is the Resiotto, and that's where they've taken the skins of the um, of, of the Amarone after they've made it into wine and they've drained off off the liquid. They'll press that and they'll put that into what's known as the Resiotto, and that again is just another big kick of flavour. So here we're in 2016, still relatively young, uh, and we're still getting very much more those sort of crunchy berry flavors but this will last a good 15 20 years before you even need to start worrying about whether you need to drink it or not because amarone is a big they're very powerful and they do take some time to just relatively mellow out you know the, the 16 it, it's approachable and you do have that freshness and and you know you you think you look at other wines that have 16 and a half percent any reds and, and maybe some of you have been unfortunate enough to have a, like an american or Australian Zinfandel that is the other wine that can really pack a punch at sort of 17% virtually. And you can immediately feel that big alcohol burn. You can immediately feel that you're dealing with a big wine. This one, there's a big mouthfeel to it. And yes, there is some alcohol, but you're not quite getting that big alcoholic burn that you do get from, from other wines that are slightly more alcoholic. Mm. but yeah hopefully that we're enjoying that um it's all sorts of <laughs> material at tea time happy days I'm, I'm obviously i'm living i'm living the wrong way um i don't know if anybody's got any questions about about the amarone I've, again i've kind of flown through um, uh, Amarone and, and again it, it, it really needs that's why this tasting quite interesting it, I could probably talk a good 45 minutes to an hour on each of the uh, of the wines that we're doing because there, there's a lot of like I say once again history and passion and story and, and really quite impressive styles uh, uh, that, that are coming out here that you don't see anywhere else in the world they're so unique to each of their own regions that we're incredibly lucky to put them all together and have that sort of style of, uh, of tasting so um, enjoy that. You know, luckily it's only a tube um, that we need to worry about rather than a whole bottle. 
Um, but um, yeah, and, and Amarone, because of the way that it's made, it is a more expensive product. You know, you, I think this wine comes in at around 35 pounds a bottle. Um, and, and, you know, you can start going up from there. And there's some wonderful, wonderful producers. And, you know, I've been lucky enough to have some stuff from 1960s and it's still brilliant. It's still knockout um wine so really really quite impressive and that is a a big uh point of reference that if it's a wine that can last 30 40 years you're looking at quality there's, there's no ifs whens or buts so um slightly overrunning on time hopefully no one's got some specific delicious dish that needs to come out at 7 30 on the dot um and if I can carry on to eight o'clock, that means the kids are in bed and I would have said, oh, sorry. <laughs> and since I've got three of them and I can hear it's bath time. Right. Um, next on our list, again, we're slightly, uh, shall we say, bending the rules of fortified, but they're festive, so we're okay. We have here is the uh, René Renault. If you could get a more French name than René Renault, uh, you'd be doing well. Uh, and um, this is from the Loire um, and 1999. OK, and we are Loire, we're Chenin Blanc. OK, and we're from the region of Bonnezot. Um, and Bonnezot is a really small little region within the Loire. Loire's obviously known predominantly for, for some of its more illustrious um, siblings, the, 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 you know, the Sancerre from Sauvignon Blanc and, and the Puy Fuisse. Sorry, what I'm talking about, the Puy Fume. My apologies. Uh, I was just checking that everyone was still uh, awake and not asleep. Um, and uh, we often forget that the, the, the Loire, you know, it's as much as it's made Sauvignon Blanc, uh, you know, and championed it and makes some excellent from terrain all the way through. Chenin Blanc is a grape that it has made phenomenally famous. Um, and yet it still remains, uh, you know, slightly under, uh, under the radar. And, uh, and yet, you know, we know, we know Chenin Blancs from the likes of uh, South Africa, which has sort of championed it and made it into a wonderful sort of easy, easy to drink sort of grape. Um, and yet, uh, we, we don't really know, you know, these these wines, the, the sort of Saumurs um, and and other and the Carte de Chaume who, who make some of the, well, you know, the, the most ageable wines from Chenin Blanc, which is actually, a, it is no hard, it is no mean feat. Where is it? There we go. Here we go. So we're a little bit, um, a little bit more of a simplistic map, but Again, you know, Puy Fume here at the back and Menetou Salon and the Sauvignon Blancs, you, you, you sort of get those. But, you know, if you look at, at, at these other ones, and, and Vouvray is another great example, but we're in Bonnezot, which is a little bit closer towards uh, Nantes, towards the coastline. Um, Chenin Blanc's a little bit like Riesling in the sense that it, it's a quite delicate grape. It's quite hard to, to get right. Um, and yet, if you allow it, to, to become a, a, an amazing um, overripe grape and then it goes through a certain amount of botrytis, it somehow has this ability to age. And so Vouvray's, there's some Vouvray's that, you know, totally drinkable from the, the 50s, 60s, and they still have that minerality. They still have that acidity. So it, it, it's, it, it's, it's always a shame that, you know, you don't see enough of these uh, and, and, and it's one of these amazing things. So. Chenin Blanc is quite a thin skin grape, so it's one of the reasons that it's quite attractive for trying to, to ripen with this noble, uh, the noble rot. So for, for those who, who might not know, it's the same wines, that, that the same fungus that attacks the salsa, uh, the, that attacks the, uh, the grapes for sauternes. So essentially it's a little fungus, it's, a, it's actually a mould that grows on the outside of the grape if the conditions are right, and it normally needs good dry conditions, but you need to have a little bit of humidity um, to allow that to, to that mold to take hold. And um, it's a fine balancing act because the mold grows, it then starts making little holes in the grapes, which then bring out a bit of the moisture. Um, and in the perfect conditions, 
it sort of shrivels the grape if it's the, and then it could tip over and it becomes mold um which is gray rot and then you've got to throw the grape away so it's very very difficult thing to do um and you've got essentially in your glass a beautiful sort of honeysuckle caramelized nose um and you know yeah i'm always amazed by these wines because they have that sweet characteristic that we look oh so good they have that sweet characteristic that we want but it doesn't have that unctuousness that we get from so turn uh, uh, you know the, the the sort of riper so turns made from sort of Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc and which are maybe slightly more unctuous and the reason is that Chenin has just more of that acidity than you'll see in Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon grapes and so really quite lovely um and, and yeah and Greg sort of says he's got marmalade and caramel Julia's worried about mold but it, it's 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 noble rot so it's okay it's noble so don't don't panic um but it, it is essentially it's, it's a type of mold. Um, uh, Botrytis, Botrytis cinericea is its actual name, um, and it, it's coveted. But it's um, you know it, it is quite a difficult thing to really get perfectly right. But again, this is uh, a, a beautiful example of uh, essentially what can be coming from from Bonazur. This is uh, René Rounou, um, who unfortunately passed away. His son now has it, but he's old school Bonazur. He grows his Chenin. He just makes sweet wines. Um, and, and, you know, I think for a half bottle for sort of 28 pounds, which is what we do it at. And sorry, that's not a half bottle. It's half a litre, so 500 uh, milliliters. So three quarters of a bottle, shall we say. Um, I think that's excellent value. And I always, I love serving this more at Christmas time because when we come to that big feast uh, and, and you start serving Sauterne, it's quite cloying, it's quite heavy. And then yet you've got this, which really lifts your palate and you get such lovely, you still get that marmalade characteristic and you still get that sweetness, but it really still lifts and cleanses your palate rather than Sauterne, which can kind of be, overly cloying if, if, if um, at certain times, you know, so it has its place, but for me, you know, a Chenin, and, and, and you have those particular Shannon notes as well, which are absolutely delicious. You sort of get those slightly stone fruits, slightly marmalade definitely, uh, and, and, you know, less of the, probably the marmalade, um, the, the real, um, citrus peel that you can candied citrus peel that you can get from Sauternes. And again, yeah, I, I can't obviously I've sung the praises slightly of, of, of the Chenins of, of um, the Loire, but they, they really should be dug out. And if you think, you know, I, I, and I'm, I'm sort of aged Vouvray's from the late 60s, late 70s, you can pick up for under 100 pounds a bottle, which is a lot of money to spend. But you're like, it's extraordinary to, to get that quality. You try and get 60, 70 so turn and you'll be paying um, over the odds. You said you find that texture strange, Julia. Is that probably because you're getting a sweetness, but you're getting a very delicate light lift. Um, and that that's that Shenin. I mean, that is the, the Shenin, but it, you'll probably get that as well, possibly from uh, Rieslings. Um, and Anna, you're asking, do they make the 99 every year? Yeah, he, uh, you, you, you're putting me on the spot there. I, I, I think every year they, they will be able to make it. Um, uh, occasionally they'll probably have bad years, which um, I, I'm, my, my bonazor knowledge is, is relatively limited um, as to what is the excellent years. But uh, there is their bread and butter, so they will make it on, on many a year. Um, and, uh, you know, they... they Lucky for us, it's not a massively known thing. So you can easily pick up packs of six um, without too much difficulty. And, and I know they've got stocks going back even further than that. So again, um, for those who want a quick trip, you know, go to the Loire. We know Sancerre, we know Pouille Fumé. Don't even bother driving all the way up into there. Come and have a look at, at you know, 
the, more some of those regions like the Vouvray and, and stick to the, to the center of town and you'll see some absolutely amazing wines um, and they do them and, and, and Vouvray does a, a dry sec, demi sec and a moelleau and they, they do different flavor profiles. So it really is interesting. Oh, somebody wants to say something. No, no it just it, we're getting to the end of four to five. Too many clicks. So, um, just recognizing the time that we're, we're close to an hour, we are now uh, into some. Um, hopefully, everyone's got a bit of chocolate. But for those who think that their palates are jaded, no, you don't need chocolate. Don't don't worry, Julia. Don't you? You, don't, you don't need chocolate. If you've got anything sweet in the house. Um, you, you'll see, you'll see what I mean here. If you've got vanilla ice cream, then you're in for a treat. Uh, but, uh, but you'll immediately see when you try and pour it out, we are pouring a very different beast here, people. Um, <laughs> and um, there, 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 there's a reason. There's a reason for that. So we are back down in uh, Jerez, Sherry territory. Okay, we're still with uh, the, the, the same uh, producer that we, we, we've gone, which is El, El Maestro, Sierra. Okay, and um, Pedro Jimenez is a, is, a, is a grape that obviously can be, you know, can put up with quite a lot of temperatures, but I don't know where they, they, they think that there's a, it was brought over by the Germans, and there's a story whereby um, I'm trying. I'm trying to think that the name. Uh, they're, they're pretty sure it's came, it came from from Germany, and there's a guy's name who oh, I've forgotten. The, I've forgotten the story now. Um, so it's too late. That's the danger of fortified, you see. But um, it, it, they reckon it comes from, from Germany, but. Um, uh, and it's a great that they've decided what they do is, is do very similar to what, what they do with the Amarone, is that they put it um, uh, on straw mats under the hot sun and they get them really, really concentrated. But more, I mean, Amarone, it, it's looking uh, probably like the grapes, you know, when we've left them, left them in the fruit a basket for a couple of days and we're like, oh, I'm not, not sure I want to eat that grape because it's a bit shriveled. That's Amarone. They, these guys, they're going to virtually, they look like raisins. I mean, that, that, that's how concentrated we're getting. So you're getting this huge concentration of flavor and the sugar is really, really getting massively concentrated. And then what happens is, is they press that, but the pressing takes so long. They sort of do it uh, in a refrigerated room. Uh, in, well, at nighttime, they start the process to try and keep the freshness. And then it takes probably several days for them to actually press what is the remaining liquid out of it. It's virtually a treacle. And then um, it, it's essentially, um, you know, it, it's got, you know, that sort of raisin characteristics as the juice. They then stop the fermentation at about 10 uh, degrees, uh, sorry, 10% 10, 10 alcohol, which then stops the fermentation process. And then it then joins back to our Solera system of the Pedro Jimenez. So again, it can age for, for probably about 12, 15 years, but it's not something that you just, you know, uh, drink sort of as an aperitif, as you can tell. It, it is Christmas in a glass. There, there's no denying that, but it's it's cloying, it's thick, it's, um, but it, it has this amazing complexity of flavor completely explosive it's probably you'll still be tasting it in a good 15 20 minutes it's probably wow i mean that is quite impressive <laughs> i mean it really is concentrated raisins and 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 concentrated christmas in a glass you've got this candied fruit you've got all of these beautiful molasses flavors really quite exciting uh, and um you, you can see you know there's still amazingly a certain amount of, of, of freshness there you've got this acidity that's there it, it's not overly killing your palate there's a little bit of a lift but you know pedro jimenez is small glasses you're not going to get loads of you know, you're not going to drink 
a whole bottle of the Pedro Jimenez and, and, and um, it, in a sitting. And, and a lot of people sort of say, well, what do you do with it? I mean, yes, I, you know, I, I soak my, some of my Christmas pudding in it, in it for, for sure. But then you also get um, people that put it, it, it's, it always seems a bit of a waste, but, and it seems very odd, but if you pour it over a little bit of vanilla ice cream, it's one of the most extraordinary flavor profiles you've ever seen. Um, so it really is lovely. And also, um, if, you, if you just pour it over some fresh strawberries in the summer, a bit of chilled, wow, just absolutely amazing. But again, it's a relatively um, specific style. And, and now, unfortunately, what you see a lot of the Pedro Jimenez, this is used to sweeten our, our friend Diamantiado to make a sweeten Amontillado. So you can see that you've got that complexity of flavor. So if you have a relatively simplistic Amontillado and you mix it up with a, with a bit of Pedro Jimenez, that's how they blend it. And unfortunately, that's what you see a lot of happens. Is it's, it's really the sort of the filler and the, and the sweetener add, additive to a, a, a lot of the wines, um, a, a sort of a lot of the sherries, the sweetened sherries that, that are over there. Sorry, I've got lots going on there. Um, Okay, that's fine. So apologies. Um, so guys, we've we've kind of run through the gambit and I, I know I've been relatively quick, but hopefully I've been able to sort of showcase um, so, some interesting wines. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna have a bit of a, a, a favorite. So if everyone else is fortified, well, we might not remember what we tasted the first time. So um, if you can remember, uh, who have we got for the for the uh, our, our first? I seem to have lost the tube. There you go. There we are. There we are. <laughs> that's, how, that's how much I've had. So who 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 had a the Madeira? Do we have a, a winner on the Madeira? Or well, we got two, three, four? We've got to remember this is out of six. So we, that's six. Out of six people. I think. Yeah. One, two, three. Wow. Happy days. I'm thinking that the Amontillado wasn't wasn't the favourite. Didn't, didn't win many hearts. Yes. Dom's just going to put his hand up all the time. Was he always like this, Felicity? Just put his hand up permanently. Yeah, OK. Just a look of, of disdain and forlorn worry. Now, now he's someone else's problem, Steph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how about uh, the, the Newport LBV? Yeah. Got one, two, three there. Ah, oh, the, Anna's, Anna's lovely, perfect, happy days. Um, any any takers for our Amarone? Oh, happy days. No, yeah, okay, fine, okay. I think the, 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 the Chenin, the, the Rene, do we have a winner for those? We had two, three, four. Ooh, fine, yeah, okay. That, that, was, that was the win, that was the win, okay. Um, and then PX, well, it, it's its own little animal. I mean, it's lovely, but I, I'm not expecting everyone to put up their hands up. I'm going to go buy loads. Um, so actually, I'm quite surprised. I think I think the the the, the rainwater reserver kind of won it. It was a very quiet uh, uh, appraisal, but everyone seems to have um, to have kind of fallen in love with it. So um, I've got, let's have a look at some um, some questions. Uh, Trina, you're, the price of this, uh, I think I answered that because that was probably in regards to, was it in regards to the Pedro Jimenez or was it in regards to the Shenin? I'll let you come on. Maybe she's just, no, she's gone. Uh, I think the Pedro Jimenez in a half. The Pedro Jimenez. The Pedro Jimenez in a half. I, I, it, it's, it's not... I think I want to say it's about 18 pounds for a half. So, and you can start, you, you know, that's, that's a good quality one. You can start going up. Um, that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can start paying phenomenal sums for, for, for some of them, but, um, and then, um, yeah, I, well, it's, uh, it's been very, very enjoyable for me. I can't tell you to taste all of these uh, fortifies one beside the other. It's a real, real treat. So um, which one is your favourite? For me, um, yeah. do you know what? Probably the most surprising was the the René Renault, uh, the Chenin, because I always forget. I mean, I've got a love of, of Madeira and I've got a, and I've got a love of Sherry, so I kind of I'm, I'm already quite excited about those. 
uh, and port has uh, a place um, for mine. Um, but it, uh, but I was yeah I was I was not sure how that would come across, and I'm actually always surprised at how expressive it is on the palate, and yet it, it's it has that delicate feeling like all of these other fortifieds. It's still a bit of a still a bit of a bruiser, you know. You've got a lot yeah. of going on, and you you sort of your you, your mouth's quite in a pleasant way a, a, assaulted with all of these complex and relatively impressive flavors. And then this Shenan comes along and it's got this lovely sort of lifting fresh fruit and it just cleans the palate and you, you're left with a, a really sort of refreshed feeling. And you think, wow, that's lovely. And you've got a little bit of tinge of sweetness. And so um, I'm always, um, yeah, I, I'm always surprised that why don't I have more uh, aged, you know, semi-sweet Shenans in, 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 the, in, in my lineup. Um, and they are a ridiculously good value as well um it, it, it just in terms of what what you can sort of pay, play play for so um yeah guys thank you so much for joining I, i'm i'm here to carry on chatting so do unmute yourselves if anybody's got any particular questions that they want to ask in general um yeah i'm here thank you oh, that was really interesting good i'm i'm glad i'm Thanks glad you enjoyed it i you enjoyed it i don't I think this may be our last sort of group tasting for this year. So um, it's, uh, we're still feverishly working away. We might be able to squeeze one more, of it, but uh, these tubes are lovely. If For those of you who have enjoyed them uh, and want to give them as a gift, they're still, <laughs> I've still got about 20 packs. <coughs> Forever the salesman. <laughs> But uh, yeah, there, there's some of these packs still uh, available, so you can you, you can pass them on. And we're recording this session, obviously, so we'll we'll sort of edit it slightly, but they can enjoy those at, at their own leisure. Um, these wines. Could, could I put in a vote for what Julia said, um, which is a tasting just of Madeiras? We we spent our uh, we went on um, honeymoon, not on honeymoon, on vacation to Madeira some years ago and brought back a number of different types. And yeah. they really are quite distinctive and it'd be interesting to compare them with this subtle differences. Yeah, that, you're absolutely right. It's quite a, a specific tasting to uh, for, for, for us to try and make sure that um, we can get enough people to, to be entertained by it because it is, you know, I, I've been in the trade for 20 years and there was always, there's always two trade uh, guys that represent the, the real full gambit of Madeira going back, you know, 60, 70, 100 years. Um, and it's a very unique uh, type of, uh, of wine, but it, it would make, a, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's a, I, I've been lucky enough to go to a couple of Madeira dinners uh, and it makes an absolutely fascinating um, tasting lineup for definite. Um, so how much are the packs, Christina? I want to say seventy-five pounds all in, something around that. I think we, we offered them out for everyone for sixty-five um, as, on the early birds, but yeah, they're they're about they're about seventy-five, um, and that gets you you know that gets you the pack and and then uh, the link to the video and people can sort of taste at their own pleasure. So yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think uh, yeah, there's yeah, I mean it's it's a real. Uh, amazing tasting to do but like I say there's a lot of information there because you've got loads of different techniques from you know the estufagem from from Madeira the fully oxidized style going to the floor of, of uh, and and the, the style of cherries and then we quickly go over to port which is a completely different story we've got Amarone resting on 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 straw mats and, and concentrating themselves we then got the aged shenins with a bit of botrytis which takes it's another whole story and then we're, we finally close out on the Pedro Jimenez, which is again all the way back down to sherry. But yeah, you've you've had to absorb a huge yeah. amount of information. And um, a, a, as for me, I, I literally had to go back to my um, my school books um, to, to learn back when I did my my WSCT diploma. And I literally had to dig down and, and remember. I, I've got top line information, but um, a, a lot of the in depth information it, it sort of falls by the wayside. So. Um, well done for sticking with us. I, I enjoy those wonderful wines. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully see you guys 
on another on another tasting soon. I, I don't, we've got one on the second for those who are for Premier Crew for those who, who are going to be able to join us, which is one of our other tasting groups. That's yeah, against you mainly, that. mainly mainly wine based. Uh, that's on the second. Um, we're also having a not tasting, but we're just having a, a fireside chat with me and Tom on the eighth of December, just to essentially talk about wines that we should probably all have in uh, in our cellars and what what to look forward to in 2021 um and then we're all furiously just peddling to uh to keep up with uh, corporate entertainment as they realize that they can't have their christmas parties and so they're all coming to us to be entertained which is lovely for us um but um yeah r running four or five tastings a night uh, literally that's why normally there should be some other people on here but tom's hosting a tasting angus is hosting a tasting luke's hosting a tasting um and uh we've done that three nights in a row now and then we're doing that next week so um, it's good fun and i'm not complaining um but um yeah it's, it's keeping us very busy so um do 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 keep an eye on that i think we've got some also some some little uh Black Friday uh, little treats uh, coming up tomorrow in terms of little offers. So um, keep an eye on your emails. And I'm here to answer questions. Otherwise, I'll probably, I, I think the children are still awake. So I'm here to answer questions for at least <laughs> another 10. <laughs> Tony, congratulations from Gloucestershire, from the Cotswolds. Um, you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. See? Where so Tom was telling me that you'd be a bit of a liability, but it's, it's fine. Yes, Trina, sorry. But you're we're you're out the, that way, aren't you? We're in the Cotswolds too. Yeah. Hello. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Tier oh, two. Like the opposite side, Suffolk. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tier two. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it might be time to drop off. I think that's the, <laughs> <laughs> the danger of fortified, you know. Yeah, I know. Gin was mother, mother's ruin. Sherry probably created quite a few problems. Um, so good, well, yeah, it's it's been a pleasure, guys, seeing you guys. And uh, I'm going to wish you a very good evening and uh, look after yourselves. And um, if I don't see you beforehand, have a wonderful end of the year, guys. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Bye, everybody. Bye.